Hey everybody, welcome to Revved Up for Sunday. We're the clergy of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm Peter Walsh. I'm Elizabeth Garnsey. I'm John Kennedy. And as you know, this is a lectionary Bible study. We are in the fourth Sunday of Lent and we're back in John's Gospel. And John's Gospel is like cheesecake because it is intense. And so we're going to do a little digesting of John's cheesecake. Here we go. It is John 3, verses 14 to 21. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. So there it is. There it is. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a passage. So um, maybe I'll just give us a little context. Far away. So this passage is a little bit of a second half of a wonderful exchange in John, as many people, I know you two know, John's, or um, Jesus here is speaking to Nicodemus, who's come to him at night. So when you get to that second part, I love how that darkness and light is playing that, you know, Nicodemus is coming in the dark to the light, mm. you know, and to speak to the light. And um, he doesn't even know that that's what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, but he's somehow being seen. So I like that, that there's a hopeful glimmer there for Nicodemus that he's not aware of yet. And even the reader's not really aware of yet. Um, but love that part. And also, um, Nicodemus, you know, was one of the Pharisees, a high ranking member of the Sanhedrin who were the most devout of all the Jews. And here's Nicodemus really, really wondering who Jesus is and who, what in the world is he about? And he's unsettled, so I love, you know, this is part of Jesus' speech to him. He's giving it to him all alone in this isolated conversation. Um, and at the end of it, Jesus returns with his disciples and goes somewhere else. So I think it's, it's interesting just to picture this being said to one guy in the dark who's super wondering and curious and conflicted mm -hmm. and coming from this place of, you know, seeming law-abiding, righteous, devout, and being really unsettled by Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes, so. unsettled and curious and conflicted and also just like not really getting it yeah, yet. Yeah, not getting it. Earlier in their exchange, mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus talks about the necessity of being born from above mm -hmm. or as it's been commonly translated, born again, mm -hmm. uh, in cool. order to enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus just like can't get his head around this. He does not um, understand the symbolism, the, the mysticism of, mm -hmm. of what, what Jesus is talking about. He is thinking, he can only think in terms of inheriting eternal life in terms of natural birth. One commentator suggested that he likely had in mind Jewish um, heritability, if you will, oh, uh -huh. that, you know, if you're born from the right mother, uh, you're part of the people of God. And Jesus mm -hmm. is saying, uh, I'm introducing a new way to become the people of God. That's so anyway, that, that G yeah. Nicodemus just doesn't get it yet. And Nicodemus therefore represents um, the people as a whole who are not getting it yet, that Jesus has started to perform signs. Uh, John commonly being uh, categorized by scholars uh, as being first a book of signs and then a book of glory with, with a prologue mm -hmm. at the beginning. Uh, so Jesus is performing signs. We've seen the... Um, uh, you know, miracle at, at the wedding in Cana and mention is made of other signs through which people are starting to believe in Jesus in some way. But Jesus is, is saying here, and John is saying here, I think that the signs are not really the point. The, the point is what the signs are pointing to. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is unpacking this here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, 
Interesting that you started it, the right beginning with Nicodemus, and it seems to me as though the as the conversation goes off, uh, goes on, and he un, uh, unfolds this these truths uh, to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus struggles to understand them, that it becomes a a conversation uh, for the Johannine community about all sorts of meaning. And my or back to my early cheesecake piece, <laughs> that every bite you take has a certain richness to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's really, you know, in some sense, three bites in this, and maybe we'll just take the bites in order. The first being the whole issues of Jesus being lifted up, and the second being uh, God so loved the world, and then the third being the question of love and judgment. Uh, and, and so why don't we just start with, with the whole question of Jesus being lifted up. And, uh, and, and as Elizabeth, you've been very, very articulate about in all of our pods in the past, that uh, you can never fully describe what any th one thing means in John's gospel because it means such a, uh, a, a these terms are, are so, so rich uh, and mean so many different things. But certainly the term lifted up is a twofold term that he is lifted up on the cross and mm -hmm. he's lifted up uh, as in resurrection. And these two are intimately connected. And uh, as uh, most all know that this, this kooky, crazy, bizarre story uh, that comes out of the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers being about the time when the Israelites are in the wilderness and uh, they, are, they are murmuring, uh, a mm -hmm. phenomenal biblical phrase for complaining right. and wailing on Moses who must be in a, just like right. uh, it was before Tylenol was invented uh, <laughs> anyway and uh, and God hears the murmuring and then punishes him by sending these 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 snakes these vipers uh, that are biting them and then they uh, Moses gets the word I mean it's a kooky weird story it's right strange, they yeah. put the bronze serpent uh, up on a uh, up on a pole or some say it was up on a mountain mm -hmm. and uh, if they look upon it they will be they will be healed mm -hmm. and and Jesus uses this story as a as, as almost kind of like a parable uh, for himself which mm -hmm. that's just a the story. I mean, the story is a weird story because I mean, they even have no graven images, and here they have a graven image, mm -hmm. uh, and it said that this serpent was actually in the temple, uh, a graven image of that, and that uh, if you go to Mount Nebo today, there's a phenomenal Franciscan. Uh, Franciscans built this cross with the serpent on it that's kind of oh, in the wow. shape of the cross. And so wow. what you get is this thing is if you look upon the serpent, you're healed. And mm -hmm. now we have Jesus. Mm -hmm. If you look upon Jesus in belief, you are healed. Salvation means healing mm -hmm. and uh, the kind of reverberation, all that. But it's yeah. a phenomenal. It's a great story. A phenomenal story. They're, they're such yeah. complainers. We hate this miserable food. <laughs> But it's also the place where we get that medical symbol, you know, yeah. the snake serpent on a pole. Yes. Oh, I forgot um, that. Oh, super cool. American Medical Association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, so. yeah. I World that. Health Organization as well and the American, yeah. uh, the Army Medical Corps. I was oh, looking yeah. into this a little bit. That's worth this podcast alone. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah no, okay, I forgot that. Next That's week super for, good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but it's super interesting. I know. Um, yeah, the lifting up uh, also in John, just the way, you know, Jesus is telling Nicod Nicodemus, you have to be born anothen, you know, born again or born from above. The lifting up is, in John, um, both the resurrection, I mean, both the crucifixion lifted up on the cross and the resurrection and ascension. Mm. Like, he doesn't have any division between mm. these three yeah. liftings. And um, so, in a way, for us, I think that's difficult, too, to think of Jesus glorified on the cross, but also in the resurrection. Like, it's it's all of a piece. So... You know, we we tend to divide these two things as two separate events, right. and for John, they're just the one thing, the one mm -hmm. event, yep. continuous. Mm -hmm. Wow, so so rich here, cheesecake, as you said. <laughs> um, one interesting thing about the, the serpent in our health organization, just as a little footnote here, uh, I actually thought the basis was this biblical passage in Numbers, but the reading I did attributed it more to Greek mythology but that this is a sort of parallel thing. So that this is somehow a sort of perennial archetypal oh, image, right. mm. which is just a crazy thing. Like, were, did these traditions, did these stories develop independently or was there some, mm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, cross communication across these cultures? I don't know, I didn't, didn't have time to do that deep dive, but I just thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, and, and inter so interesting how Jesus in his crucifixion particularly functions as a cure. Um, I think this gets right to the heart of 
what salvation is about. Obviously, John 3.16, the verse we're, we're probably going to touch in, in a minute or so, is the most probably the most famous verse about salvation in mm-hmm. the Bible. Yeah. And um, certainly one of the most famous, famous verses in the Bible, period. And to connect it to this numbers episode, which is super weird. The no graven images thing is weird. And uh, did you mention the, the part about King Hezekiah destroying the serpent? No, no, I, I, it was only so much it just, time. Right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, no, I left it just, out Hezekiah. So a, a later King of Israel destroys <laughs> the serpent, which was kept in the temple because people were worshiping it. So super, super strange story. Anyway, so the, the problem with, with the Israelites in the wilderness is that they're afflicted by some, you know, some malady that the snake's biting them and killing them. And so translated into the world of, of the gospel of John and the world of, of Christian theology, our affliction is evil, darkness, uh, sin, and that somehow by looking <laughs> at um, evil in its worst form, you know, the evil we do, putting God incarnate on the cross, that somehow becomes salvific, you know, medicinal healing for us. Uh, just a shocking thing that as the snake in the desert, the snake on the pole warded off the other snakes. So like looking at the death of the son of God, sort of our death in a way, the way that we're always dealing death, looking at that can heal and ward off our own death uh, spiritually and maybe otherwise um, super, super rich. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I don't think yeah. it's something mysterious. I think John is literally saying it plain. Mm-hmm. You know, if we look at what we've done, our deeds are exposed mm-hmm. to the light and we can be forgiven. You know, and to me, that's what looking upon, you know, to the way that you had, they had to look upon this serpent. And now if we look at Jesus on the cross and realize he is also raised and comes back to forgive, um, you know, we can see the evil that we've done. And in John's so much about seeing and not seeing and mm-hmm. to, and it goes on later, their deeds were evil, not exposed to the light, you know, hidden in darkness to look upon Jesus and not look away from him on the cross is the saving thing, I think, because when you can see what you're doing, you can't do it anymore, or you're likely not to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. And I personally feel like that's that's what the cross is about. Oh, interesting. Wow. Wow. Uh, certainly, I, I'm surprised you just said that. Uh, Are you? Yeah. I mean, at least the last sentence I'm surprised by. Oh, um, okay. Not, not the previous sentence. It's the last sentence I was surprised by. It's certainly... Uh, it, one of the things that we've talked about before is uh, unified visions of the world versus dualistic versions of the world. And I always uh, never think of you as having a dualistic ver- vision of the world. Is that, is that, uh, um, did, I would like to hear what you heard. Well, I, um, so in, in John's gospel, I mean, John has a very dualistic view of the mm. world, light mm. and dark, and even what the world means. <laughs> I mean, God so loves the world, which is obviously the word cosmos, which is the whole of everything, uh, cosmos in Greek. And uh, and that uh, as the world moves through John's gospel, the world becomes, in some sense, darker, and the world begins to represent uh, everything that is uh, uh, opposed to God and opposed to Jesus, and that in the end of John's gospel, the reference to the world is to be opposed to Jesus and his followers, and, and as though the world is infected by the serpent, is infected by evil and by sin, mm-hmm. uh, and that um, this is not, let's just say this is not creation theology here. This is, this is a, a creation that, that has uh, gone awry and doesn't receive. I mean, it's all in the prologue. It, you know, mm-hmm. he was, the whole very purpose of Jesus' incarnation in John is to come and have this, this healing, this salvation and those who, you know, uh, his own people received him not, as mm-hmm. it says in the prologue. And so that gets, begins to get unfolded mm-hmm. here. And then it gets super unfolded in chapter five in John's gospel. Um, uh, and so I think what caught me by surprise was uh, your, maybe I, maybe I was just uh, expecting you to say something else. And, and you said, if by looking upon the cross, you can see your own sin, I think is what, what caught me a little off guard. I think I mean looking at Jesus having been killed by human violence, that we did that. Okay. That's okay. what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't think it's some magical exposure of all my misdoings and wrongdoings and oh, that's, that's how hateful I heard thoughts. It. That's what no, I, it's I, liter- I heard. No, to me it's exactly that violence that Jesus is trying to reveal 
among our in the cosmos, the the world of the earth and its kingdoms and human in, systems, you know, that we yeah. the we commit violence in the name of God or in the name of, you know, our religious righteousness to shut out the people that don't don't conform or all the things. But anyway, the lifting up to me, I was just trying to comment on that first part that we're taking on, the first bite of our cheesecake, <laughs> that, you know, the looking upon this lifted up Jesus is revelation of right. what's yeah. actually happening here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, John, I know you haven't any, said anything, but I just Sorry, want to jump I in again. No, 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 no. Yeah. I, I just want to talk about the word revelation. So, mm -hmm. and then, uh, uh, and then, John, you can talk for the next 23 minutes. Yeah. But anyway, sure. sorry sure. about that. I, I'm cutting in out of out of order here. But I, I just want to say something about this this question of lifting up and what do we see. And in John's gospel, it says that, you know, the, the glory of God is going to be revealed. You know, glorify me uh, as I glorify you. The, all that stuff that's coming mm -hmm. further. But the glory that's being talked about in John's gospel is not look at how great I am or look at how great God is. That's the, that's the Greek understanding of glory, but the Hebrew understanding of glory, the word glory comes from the Hebrew term for heaviness or weightiness. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the glory is going to be the revelation of of God the Father, the divine, the divine being. And by seeing the revelation of the divine being, you know that Jesus is the revelation of a divine being. That's the glory. Is So when Jesus says, glorify me, that I may glorify you, he's saying, show your being in me that I may show your being to the world. Mm -hmm. So that's what's being lifted up on the cross and being lifted up in the resurrection mm -hmm. is the being of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the being of God being one of such a, a profound love that passes understanding that God would take our darkness, our, our sickness on God's self rather than allow us to continue to suffer the consequences. Okay, then I got one for you here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so this is why this thing is cheesecake. So we begin, God so loved the world, yeah. and what's in the next, in the same sentence? Perish. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then we go from <laughs> this, 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 you know, placard at the football game, God yeah. so loved the world, and then we go down one level, and we get love and judgment, mm -hmm. condemnation yeah. and conviction. And so how do you square God so loved the cosmos, and we got perishing and conviction and condemnation? Mm -hmm all over the place yeah well it does it says specifically god does not condemn or judge i mean that's how i read this is that god loved the world in this way gave his son so we won't perish but have yes. eternal life and he did not send the son into the world to condemn the world but that the world could be saved mm -hmm. so i mean i think it squares pretty well yes yes i i agree and and yet even given that there still is this theme of judgment and condemnation that will come about somehow, regardless mm -hmm. of the agent of it in John's gospel, which I think is one of the great tensions and one of the sources of disagreement about how God's love and justice, as it's commonly um, framed, are, are balanced uh, and, uh, and hopefully harmonized. Um, you know, I was just on a trip with a bunch of kids, youth, I should say, teenagers, for the last week at the Taizé community in France, and I got peppered with all sorts of theological questions, <laughs> all the unanswerable which I love. Answer. I really love. So, you know, questions like, you know, if God loves the world, like how is there so much suffering and, and pain and, and evil in the world? Why did Jesus have to die? All that stuff. Uh, I love having to explain that or try to explain it or have a conversation about it with, um, with, with young people. And, you know, I, I think it, it comes down to the, the idea that, it's, it's a very Judeo-Christian theology of creation that God created a world that is not God. That the, the cosmos that God loves is not just some sort of manifestation of the divine being like it is in some other traditions. It is not God, right? Um, it is infused with the presence of God, but it isn't the same thing as the divine being. And therefore, it has freedom, particularly the, the sentient beings in this cosmos have the freedom to... Um, choose life or death, choose light or darkness, that we have real agency. And of course, we, uh, as, as Christianity and Judaism interpret human experience and, and basically the history of the world, um, we misuse that agency. And this is a problem in so far, it's a problem in a lot of ways, but it's a problem 
with regards to this question of salvation and condemnation insofar as if God is committed to saving the world, but God will not coerce us into going along with that salvation um, to the extent that we choose darkness over light, we will be condemned in some way when God, um, you know, at on the last day, but uh, in all sorts of other ways leading up to it, when God um, deals with uh, everything that interferes with people coming into the light, that interferes with um, uh, the world being a place of justice and peace. Uh, you know, in, in the Jewish thought of Jesus's time, there was, uh, there was the present age, but there was also the age to come. And the idea is in this age to come, God will do a few things. God will deal with evil, kind of like put it away in some way. He will rescue Israel and usher in a t- a, an era of justice and peace. And so condemnation of darkness, uh, uh, of those aligned with the darkness, seems to be a necessary part of that coming about, unless everybody is persuaded to go along with it, which is, you know, a possibility that many Christian theologians going back to the patristic period held out hope for. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's well, I, it's interesting I and I'm cutting in again. It. Sorry, I'm going to have to be oh, edited out of this podcast here. <laughs> Rob, so do we, take me out whenever you want, but I, I just, uh, it, just, to. Uh, yes to what you're saying, but it seems to me that in John's gospel, what we have here is realized eschatology. In other mm. words, uh, that this is already happening. So those who believe already receive a taste of eternal life and eternal life is bigger than just a long a duration. It's a different oh, quality of life. Yeah. It has to do with the, uh, with the divine mm-hmm. life, but also there's a realized judgment. In other words, these yes. people are yes. being judged, not because God is judging them. Their own actions are judging them. They're judging themselves by their actions and that that judgment is already in play. So that the, this isn't about the, the age to come. I think in John's gospel, the age to come has come, is coming. It is, mm-hmm. It's here it's in Jesus. In it's come Jesus. in. It's yeah. come in. Right. I think it's both actually, because in chapter five, uh, it says the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Um, oh, interesting. So it's, I think both are in John. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and, nice, and in the nice Johannine letters too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, wasn't it that, that John, can't, uh, Jesus can't be totally actionable in John's gospel until he is, until what you were talking about, his death, resurrection and ascension, that he, it's not actually all happened mm-hmm. uh, or, or released. I think there's a bit of that. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about that because in John, in the prologue, there's this sense of a eternal, the, the word eternal is like God's age. You know, it's more like the Kronos Kairos thing where we live on this timeline, but Jesus is an unending presence, you know, of God mm-hmm. and has taken on flesh to be with us and dwell with us and show us literally what God is like. And so I think when we get these terms like eternal life or the day will come when all will rise, I feel like in a way, everything is subsumed into the presence, the unending presence of God after having divided ourselves from it, you know, that mm, eventually yeah. all gets re- resumed in, because that's what God is, is, you know, he loves the world that way, you know, and I feel like um, I, I tend to resist the timeline versions of Ionion, you know, the, the ages to come and things like that. I feel like in John that it, from the prologue it's the the stage is set that um you know Jesus has come into the world this is the new age and those who decide not to embrace it um it is self-condemning like you said or it's not it's, and the word condemn I think is too much for us we it's it's a word like it, to me I like the word cutting off better you know it's like some sort of we get this idea that God is up there keeping score up, you know, somewhere keeping scores and going to put the gavel down on us and send us to jail forever and ever. You know, I don't feel like that's the sense of condemn for God and that condemnation is, um, comes with, you know, punishment and forever guilty and, and those kinds of connotations. But I think that what John is trying to say here is, or Jesus is trying to say here is that, um, you know, when we choose the darkness, that's a life of separation. And, and so that's why I like, you know, 
I'd rather replace the word condemn with cut off. You know, God did not send the, his son into the world to cut off the world. You know, but the opposite, you know, to unite us with, with God. And so I, I find it just so problematic, all this English translation of these words that are in John so complex and, um, and also straightforward. They're not so mysterious as we make them out to be. I think maybe what they might be is uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable because they're so slanted into these narrow definitions. I, I totally agree that, that looking at matters of divine judgment, even, you know, condemnation in some way, um, are, are not rightly understood as, as legal, uh, realities where, where God, uh, you know, pays us back because we did or did not do X, Y, Z thing. I see it much more as an organic, spiritual, kind of mystical Mm -hmm. thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's profoundly mysterious. And yeah, I mean, the eternal life is, is absolutely, I, I 100% agree that the life of God, uh, the divine life that we are invited to share in. And I think the sense of eschatology in, in John uh, and throughout the New Testament is that the time will come when, you know, heaven and earth will become one in some way. At the end, the last part of the Bible is the heavenly city coming down. Um, and I think that that's what eternal life is, is all about, that, that we are more and more caught up uh, in the divine life. Um, but wow, I mean, we have to stop talking. Well, that, I'm going to I'm going so to wrap us up. Just, I'm just going to wrap us up just where you are. So, uh, in in John's Gospel, uh, life uh, is used much more than it in in the Synoptic Gospels. Mm-hmm. And if you take all the Johannine literature, uh, the the letters and the Book of Revelation, you see that it's even more so. And I think it's fair for us to say, and Johannine scholars would agree, that the, the end of time in the book of Revelation, I think it's chapters 20 and 21, where uh, we don't, go, you know, we don't mm-hmm. go up to heaven. It's not the rapture. The, the no. heavens come to yeah. earth. Uh, and that the, the life that, that comes, the, the divine life, the heavenly life, is, that same, is the same term used for uh, life in John. Uh, and and mm. the gospel according mm. to John is the gospel of life. That's what it's referred to mm-hmm. as the gospel of life. So, so everybody, thanks for hanging in for 25.3 minutes here with us. Uh, we hope that uh, the gospel of life brings you that type of eternal life, that life of the divine which is present now uh, and is the thing that uh, enlivens the soul beyond words. Uh, as you know, we love it when you share what we do, when you respond to what we do. And uh, as always, we have the warm line uh, 203-442-5002. Uh, peace be with you. God bless you. Thanks for hanging in there with us.